All right, great. Let's get started. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this ETIP Ocean webinar on ocean energy installation and marine operations. My name is Lotta Piertima. I'm the Policy and Project Officer at Ocean Energy Europe, who coordinates ETIP Ocean, the European Technology and Innovation Platform for Ocean Energy that aims at accelerating uh, the sector on its way to industrial rollout. And, um, the platform is uh, coordinated together with Technalia, the University of Edinburgh, and Wavec Offshore Renewables. And um, before going into today's uh, topic, I just wanted to mention that this webinar will be recorded, and the recording along with the presentation slides will be on our website at etpotion.eu in the event, events section, so you can find them there uh, after the, the webinar in a couple of way, uh, days. And we have three presentations today and a Q&A after that. So please write your questions at any time during the presentations in the Q&A box on the right hand side of your screen and we will take them um, after the presentations. Um, so today's discussion is about insulation and marine operations for ocean energy. And because the sector is still quite emerging and uh, we have relatively few installations. Uh, there isn't a full um, specialized supply chain in what comes to installations, but uh, a lot of uh, the sector is using a lot of uh, other maritime sector equipment and, and expertise, such as from um, oil and gas or, or the fishing industry, for example. However, as the sector is progressing and now we've seen the installation of full-scale full devices and, um, and multi-device arrays as well, uh, it is clear that uh, this kind of um, tailored uh, equipment and staff and expertise is needed and, um, and, um, and that's what we are here uh, talking about today. We have uh, three great presentations coming up, so they will uh, share you their experiences on installation um, and about how to get the devices in the water uh, faster, more safely and in a more cost effective way. So before the presentations, I would like to give the floor to Jose Luis Villate to give a little background to this webinar topic. Jose Luis Villate is the Offshore Renewable Energy Director at Technalia and the co-author of the strategic research and innovation agenda on which this webinar is based. Um, so I will give the floor to Jose Luis. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, thank you, Lota, for for the introduction. Now you should be able to share okay. your screen. Yeah. Perfect. So I think should be there. And you see now? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Perfect. So uh, good afternoon again, uh, Lota. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'm going to make a very short introduction of the. Uh, strategic research and innovation agenda that is the uh, background document uh, supporting this series of uh, webinars about technology for ocean energy and uh, the sra is a uh, is a reference document for the whole ocean energy sector and gives uh, specific input to public uh, funding bodies including member states for inspiring r d uh, calls for example we uh, see some uh, concept or uh, aspects of the SRA included in the first draft of a uh, European horizon calls for ocean energy. Uh, the report has not pre been produced from scratch. Uh, it's an update of the previous study uh, agenda produced in 2016. And the main driver for this update has uh, was reaching ocean energy commercialization. With this purpose, we try to involve as many sector stakeholders as possible. The SRA was officially launched last year in June. Uh, uh, one, one year ago, and it's uh, a public document. This SRA has been developed in a context where Ocean E can play a crucial role in meeting the European Green Deal objectives and a 100% decarbonized energy system. Different European strategies, for example, the offshore renewable energy uh, strategy uh, produced by the European Commission 
in November last year, um, are behind this, uh, this document. Uh, we believe that ocean energy can be the next uh, big thing in uh, energy. The SRA includes a chapter which quantifies the effort on research, technology development, and innovation needed to move forward this sector. 1 billion euros should be mobilized from 2021 to 2025, uh, five, from which one third would come from private investment. Due to the stage of development of ocean energy technologies, 70% of funds should be devoted for demonstration, pre commercial, and industrial rollout actions. Uh, the SRA uh, defines a number of challenge areas which represent a set of uh, research and development fields that the ocean energy uh, sector has identified as, was, uh, as most worth investment during the next period of four or five years. After a paratheresis exercise, uh, the ocean energy industry and research professionals agreed that the design and validation of ocean energy devices is the most urgent and crucial uh, area to focus on. Uh, there are other uh, areas uh, I'm in to support this one, and today we want to focus on the logistics and marine operations. But the SRA also covers uh, connection, mooring, um, integration DNA system, or data collection. A similar priority exercise was conducted for the identification of a number of priority topics per challenge area, according to the priority for the sector in Europe and the urgency to be overcome. For each priority topic, the SRA defines its scope, applicability, wave, tidal, or both, specific action to be carried out, impact expected uh, of deploying these actions, the technology maturity at the start and end of the actions, and the budget required, giving indication of a number and size of projects. As I said before, the webinar today deals with logistics and marine operations. Within this uh, challenge area, uh, there are two topics uh, that they were prioritized. One for optimizing uh, marine uh, logistics and operation, and the second one focus on instrumentation for condition monitoring and predictive maintenance. Both propose to bring experience from other sectors, but also to develop bespoke solutions for specific ocean energy challenges. Sharing experience and data is also an important action for both with the aim of reducing operational and maintenance costs and increasing um, energy production. And I hope, uh, thank you very much for your attention, I hope the three presentations we have today is a good um, step to start sharing experience. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jose Luis. Um, I would like to introduce our first uh, first of the presentations. So, uh, Jason Schofield, the Managing Director of uh, Green Marine UK uh, will tell us more about their work and um, experiences in installing ocean energy. So the floor is yours, Jason. Thank you, uh, Lotta. Thanks for the introduction and um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'll try to share the screen now. I think, uh, should be hopefully. Um, Perfect. It's working now. Yeah. Yep. Okay, excellent. Okay, well, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, for those uh, that don't know me, I'm uh, Jason Schofield. I'm Managing Director of Green Marine, and we're based up in uh, the north of Scotland, up in the Orkney Islands. Um, I'm going to attempt to move to the next slide. Here we go. Um, yeah, so our company was uh, formed in 2012, um, and basically we founded it as a spin-off from our fishing company, um, that we had vessels operating in and around Europe and other places in the world. Um, and we saw some gaps in the marine uh, renewable en energy industry that we could take our expertise into um, and look to bring some cost savings and um, and uh, long-term project viability into the sector. So primarily we uh, set up the company, uh, purchasing some vessels and, and assets and set up a team um, dedicated just solely for um, a wave and tidal energy developers that were coming up to EMEC and working up uh, up in north of Scotland here. Um, since then, and, and, and as we all know, the industry has um, has been slower to develop than what we first envisaged when we uh, invested into this into this sector. So, with that, we 
increase the services that we offer to developers. So we started um, incorporating some engineering services within our company and then providing turnkey solutions for the marine operations that we carry out, um, as well as the vessel charters that we do, um, and also moving more and more into uh, offshore wind as well with the crew transfer vessels. Um, and more recently, we are carrying out uh, uh, hydrographic and ROV surveys um, in the offshore wind sector, but also in um, in the wave and tidal energy sites here as well um, for site selection and also for cable routes and, and cable surveys. So it's been a slow um, organic growth for us over the past uh, nine years. Um, and it's been very interesting seeing uh, how developers have, uh, have come on with their technologies and such like. Um, and also in the wave energy sector, the, the development that's uh, come through Wave Energy Scotland, which I think has been key to some of the um, technology advancements that we've seen to date with their, their funding and their expertise uh, put into the mix. Some of the uh, recent projects that we've carried out um, has been a decommissioning project for Simac Atlantis Energy using um, a heavy lift a barge and also development of some bespoke tools, um, which we'll cover a bit later on. Um, and that reduced a uh, cost and risk to the client. Um, and also a uh, during the decommissioning projects, we look to reuse some of that equipment if possible. Um, and we were lucky with the Atlantis project to repurpose all of the, all of the, um, foundation and uh, gravity based moorings for the project now in the Naru Strait in Japan. So that uh, reduced them um, a sort of mobilization time for a uh, CIMEC to get all their equipment um, together and and uh, also reduce cost for the project because it was working to a to a tight budget as well. Um, we installed them um, a Wello OIS a wave energy converter and that was um, a full mooring installation, a six point mooring installation, umbilical cable, and hook up with the device. And that was used just using low cost vessels, uh, uh, such as a multicat and um, and locally available tugs as well. So trying to come up with a solution and um, installation process that that utilized the, the assets that were readily available and 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 also at a cost that um, that the project could sustain. Um, Core Power Ocean. Um, we installed their uh, their device and and uh, and cable and such like, and and removed it from a successful um, Wave Energy Scotland funded campaign up here in Orkney. Um, many of you will know that that project has been quite widely publicised. Um, another successful project that we did um, in the recently more recently tidal sector. We um, we installed Sustainable Marines platform uh, using a subsea drilling rig and a multi-cat and um, worked closely with it. Sustainable Marine Energy to uh, to successfully um, complete that operation on the west coast of Scotland. Um, and now the engineering team, um, an operational team, are now working with Sustainable Marine Energy to um, to finalise the, the, the project in the Bay of Fundy, which is upcoming, which is... Uh, an exciting one for the whole industry. Um, we also uh, um, did a full EPC uh, contract for um, Microsoft and Naval Group, and that was the installation of the um, of the uh, subsea server, um, which include the cabling and um, installation of the, the assembly and installation of the device offshore. Um, that was using a, a low cost um, heavy lift barge and and multi-cat type vessel as well that, uh, that underwent um, a two years of testing that was um, it was seen to be a, a hugely successful project um, and the site is now um, now been uh, decommissioned and um, ready for reuse. Um, also part of our Wave Energy Scotland project we work with the Umbra group and the various other um, suppliers within a uh, Europe and, and Scotland, and um, from an early stage work with them on the design of uh, 
the um, the wave energy point absorber to um, incorporate that, and also the design of the system to attach it to a a, a barge, and then the barge was then moored in um, in the scrapper flow uh, area to um, undergo a rigorous program of testing of the of the PTO unit, um, and that was. Uh, Carried out successfully as, as I said, part of Wave Energy Scotland's um, program, and uh, has since been uh, decommissioned. And the project is uh, in Scotland so far has has been closed out. Um, Umbra now has a, a PTO that they can go to market with uh, for various other projects. So, so just an overview of some of the equipment that we used in these projects. Um, so. Uh, Multicat um, type vessel is very capable. They have um, a extremely large capacity cranes. Um, they are relatively low cost. Dairy is low cost. Um, uh, we can plan most of the operations that that, uh, that that are required around here and and other parts of the uh, UK and Europe using a uh, using the multicat type vessels. Um, and I, th they are getting more and more capable. They're, they're introducing um, DP systems into these now, and there's some of them are getting larger. So it still gives you a good stable platform, but at a cost that's sustainable for the project. Um, we quite often use temporary moorings, um, which we lay down using a multicat and a tidal site. So that gives us very um, a high accuracy position keeping. Um, with uh, with um, to date, uh, we've had no failures using that system. Um, DP systems are very good as well, but uh, you, you there is a thing called DP runoff. I'm not an expert in the DP vessels, but um, others are uh, that you'll hear from um, today, hopefully. But uh, um, we 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 tend to do that as as a as a system that seems to work very well. Um, our engineering uh, department have worked an early stage with the uh, developers as well. So combining the, um, the engineering with the operational team um, does tend to uh, provide you with the best operational practices and, and best solutions um, to, uh, to have a successful outcome at the end of the project. Um, working primarily the ROVs that we use are our inspection class um quite small maybe with a um three function manipulator at, at sort of best um and we found that if you can customize some tools and things then you can improve the um the capability of these rovs and and get more out of them because when you're working the tidal current with most of the smaller inspection class rovs you uh once you go above um Around one one and a half knots, then you have problems um, station keeping. Um, divers, we we've used divers on on uh, both wave and tidal sites. The, the capabilities are very good. Um, they're restricted by the depth that they work in, and um, and it's quite a high risk as well. Um, you know, to to uh, to people, to humans, um, and. You really need to be working with experienced divers because um, you should never assume that a, a dive, dive company or a diver is uh, has experience a uh, diving in a in a benign site compared to a tidal site. It's uh, a totally different um, different environment. Um, we've worked a lot in developing installation aids for for an alternative to using divers and ROVs. So we've made them. Um, a bespoke lift frames and, and docking devices that will lock on um, to uh, to an object subsea, and you can remotely operate that from the deck of the vessel, um, and that can be reused and reused. Um, we found that has been uh, has been a great uh, success to um, increase the weather windows that you can work work in. It's safer and um, and can be used for um, also for decommissioning as well. So as well as Installation work, decommissioning work um, can be carried out using the same process. Um, 
we think that uh, you know incorpor incorporating the marine operations earlier can provide um, um, significant in input um, uh, with regards to optimising the mooring and umbilical system designs, which is quite often a, an area for failure. Um, I would strongly uh, recommend focusing on decommissioning during the early design process um, and consideration to site selection of available marine assets and operators. Um, because you can find if you've got to move something after de when it's finished the project that the cost can escalate quite a lot. So um, to try and bottom out the decommissioning processes and, and costs at an early stage is, um, is very important. Uh, we're seeing more and more drilled anchoring um, and mooring solutions becoming more favourable. Um, the development of this is happening in various uh, places around the UK and abroad. And um, I think uh, that that's something you need to look at, especially as this gives a decommissioning liability as well. Some recommendations that um, we're discussing was, um, is, is, you know, don't let the funding. I'm sorry, um, Jason, if you could wrap up um, in a couple of okay. minutes. Thanks. Yeah, this is the last yep. last slide. Yep. Yeah. No worries. Go. So, <laughs> so I was just uh, going to say that um, you know don't let the funding um, drive unsustainable decisions. So ensure the correct funding is in place at an early stage after the detailed feed study. Um, you know we've seen that that uh, plans change and it's driven by funding and not by the best best practice that we'd like to see. Um, incorporating marine operators into the funded calls and applications, I think, is a is a, is a, is a key to um, to ensuring that the process is followed from the beginning to the end. Incorporating everybody that should be involved in the project, um, and making use of marine operators' expertise and, and advice. You know, um, ourselves and others uh, in in this session, you know, they've, we've observed a lot of uh, aspects of marine operations, and that advice should be taken taken um taken uh, into the project uh, you know strong focus on that um ensure compatible material choices i just put a couple of pictures in the bottom here you'll see one month that was one month between um super duplex stainless steel and and um and uh, galvanized steel and you see the bolts were 50 percent corroded after one month so make sure that all your materials are chosen correctly um Ensure your office team has experienced personnel with real experience and lead roles. I think it's very important you have a company representative on the ground for continuing engagement. Um, we've seen that to be a, a huge um, success, having uh, operators having someone here that you speak to every day. Um, and also ensure that project schedules are realistic um, because we see, uh, we meet with investors also come and meet with us and discuss um, you know how the industry is going and things, and if we can um, keep to the pro original programs, then um, then it builds up the confidence within the industry. Um, and that I think I'm nearly onto my last slide, so that's it. Sorry for the overrun. Thanks, Jason. No worries. Some great recommendations there. Um, let's just move on to the next presentation. So the next speaker is uh, Richard Parkinson, who is the Managing Director of um, Inyanga. So I'm just going to give you the presenter rights so you can start sharing your screen. There we go. Now you should be yeah, able to yeah. Perfect. Yeah, hi everyone. I don't know if you can see my screen okay. Uh but yes. uh, yeah, and thank you very much for for inviting me to have a chat with you about uh, trying to give you some of the off, uh off tips for offshore operations and logistics. Um Bit about my own background. I, I have a background of in construction in the oil and gas industry for the last, uh, well, I've lost track, I think it's 30, 34 years or something, working on anchor handlers and rig moving and heavy lifts and that sort of stuff. And in 2006, I started work, uh, did my first title project, and it was 2007, which was a CGEM project. 
and uh, that was quite an eye opener. I think it was a very um, everyone had completely uh, uh, not accounted for the risk and the environment they were working for, and uh, it was a very very steep learning curve for everybody involved. Uh, over the years, I worked on many, many projects, title projects in particular, uh, including a major project and um, uh, projects for voice. And I previously ran a business called Mojo Maritime, which I sold. And then three years ago, I decided to start a new company and I wanted to look at um, Tidal learning, applying what I had learned in Tidal Energy and what I felt worked and what didn't work and trying to come up with a solution that I felt could be economically viable. And I started working on the hydro wing solution and just trying to, to get as many uh, lessons learned from the market in order to try and get something that I felt could be economically viable. And by that I means sort of competitive with offshore wind or other technologies in time uh, uh, and in, with realistic scale. Uh, I think some of the key challenges, obviously, with this environment is the adverse environment, environment which is needless to say why we're there. Uh, the cost of mobilizing assets, um, un unlike Jason, we don't have uh, marine assets. We hire them in for the pro project, uh, depending on uh, where we're going. And then, obviously, we're using a lot of vessels from the oil and gas industry, which is a very volatile and uh, uh, the past few years has been very depressed. However, this year it suddenly picked up again and oil and gas vessels are in very high demand and very expensive. Uh, so looking at the capability of ROVs for operating in adverse environments and then obviously looking at how you can scale up. So it's not so much about how you can install one demonstrator project, but how does that scale up and become economically efficient? In terms of our hydro wing technology, so we've, we've developed a, a multi-rotor device with six turbines using the Takado turbines. Hydrowing is 50% owner along with QED of Takado turbines. Uh, and basically our system, our hydrowing system is a subsea based system because we feel that tidal should be subsea, uh, that it's most effective, we can get the best packing density. And our launch recovery method is by actually installing the whole wing because that reduces the balance of plant cost, particularly things like control hubs, uh, connectors, and it makes the turbines really simple. Uh, just in terms of the, I won't go through all of this video because it's, it's been longer, but uh, our installation method is based on using intelligent lift frames uh, uh, without the need for ROV and I know Jason alluded to that, which we, we totally agree with and endorse uh, and we believe is perfectly feasible and then recovered to, to deck using either the DP vessel or a uh, four point mooring barge or whatever is available in the region that we're operating in and the system can be maintained and uh, uh, brought to location for maintenance, or it could be a quick repair and straight back in. Our long-term strategy is to develop a DP vessel, and we're invested in a vessel called the Nyanga Encha, which we're currently reactivating and converting for this purpose, which is a diesel electric direct current DP2 vessel, which is very, very cost efficient, uh, very low cost to run. It's on a par, if not slightly cheaper to run than a lot of the DP multicats that are on the market at the moment. Uh, and gives better lifting capability and better all round uh, operability. Uh, so that's a project that we have ongoing. Uh, the launch method is basically reverse of that and our wing is basically is uh, wet make connected. Uh, so the whole system can be uh, can be scaled up effectively. I know as Takada, we're looking at scaling up to larger turbines, the T3 turbines, which is the next generation. And obviously we will need to come up with solutions to, to launch recover those. Uh, so that basically gives you uh, an overview of the um, of the technology. In terms of the marine operations, um, we think they're absolutely core, and that the whole device should really be designed around the marine operations, and uh, that should be at the core if you're going to have an economically feasible system. Uh, we're very much focused on using an intelligent LAS, which eliminates the need for ROVs because that gives us greater operability and reduces the cost massively. If you take an uh, oil and gas vessel, the ROV team and uh, um, uh, ROV itself can be up to 12 to 20,000 a day on top of your vessel day rate. Uh, wet make connection, we've uh, always advocated that as a much simpler and we've developed several very successful wet make connection systems to be very reliable. And uh, we see that as the core of what we're developing. Uh, and also a very l rapid launch recovery method so that we can make use of, uh, you know, whether it's spring tides or neap tides, we can go in a very short window. Now, usual time from launch to recovery is in the region of about 20 minutes. Uh, installation using four point mooring barge or, or low cost DP vessels. So you can, we can use either. 
Uh, my own preference is to, and the longer term solution is to use DP vessels because I think they're quicker, uh, more efficient. However, I do take on board what Jason said about DP runoffs, which you know need to be managed very, very carefully. It's, it's obviously a risk, but we've done many, many operations with DP assets um, uh, very, very successfully. And uh, you know, by by managing it carefully, it can be can be very done safely. Um, so basically, as I mentioned, we're developing our our uh, own DP vessel, uh, which we're uh, going to be using on our projects going forward, both for our uh, hydro wing uh, projects, but also for our customer projects as well. And they're very enthusiastic about having a shared marine asset that can be uh, used uh, for cheaper marine operations. Uh, operation and maintenance is actually more crucial than installation in that it's a recurring cost and a lot of the issues developers had, particularly with the bigger turbines, has been uh, the high mobilization costs and dependency on um, on oil and gas assets. And I think this has made, meant the O&M costs are absolutely crippling. Uh, so we're very much focused on that in terms of using um, using assets that can be used locally or indeed our own, uh, our own uh, assets, uh, which can uh, maintain multiple projects. Uh, so, in terms of the uh, the impact of of the installation, and I, I think that the interesting thing with tidal energy is actually um, when you compare it to offshore wind. And I'm working on several offshore wind projects at the moment. Installation in tidal energy is actually a lot simpler and a lot easier than in offshore wind. And we've done various analysis on this, and I believe that installation is one area where tidal energy will be considerably cheaper at scale than offshore wind. I'm totally convinced of this because I think it's simpler. And I think if we get it right, uh, that can happen. And I think O&M costs could easily be on a par with offshore wind. Obviously, I'm not saying that tidal energy is going to compete with offshore wind anytime soon. We'd need massive scale for that. But there's, you know, obviously things like reducing costs of the turbines and things like that that are and um, balance of plant, particularly foundations, and that is is a must if we're going to compete with offshore wind and be taken seriously as a technology. And I got some numbers that we've calculated or we're applying to projects we're currently working on versus the uh, uh, ORE catapult numbers for offshore wind. I think obviously the key thing as well as not on O&M is also looking at condition, condition monitoring and digitalization and uh, designing out as much as possible the need to recover the devices. And that's something Takado take very seriously with the reliability of their turbines. So in conclusion, I think decoupling from volatile vessel spot markets and using dedicated purpose marine asset is going to be key for uh, large scale projects. But in the meantime, we have to make do with what's available in the regions, be it uh, multi-cats or barges or DP vessels. We've had a lot of recent experience working with DP multi-cats and uh, the new generation DP multicats are very, very impressive, to be honest. Um, installation and O&M cost strategy reduces at scale, uh, eliminating ROV, which I think Jason mentioned as well, and using intelligent LAS systems, I think is uh, is highly beneficial. And we've, as we see more and more of that, particularly working in high tidal flows. Um, I think having a good uh, installation and O&M strategy can massively reduce CAPEX, which is very much at the core of what we're trying to do at at um, uh, hydrowing, I know with floating solutions do reduce the O&M cost, but I think that's at the expense of pushing the capex up quite considerably. Uh, project clustering and working in collaboration with other developers we see as absolutely key. Sharing assets, and that's obviously the um, behind our investment in our in our asset is to share that asset with other developers and also other um, other companies that may want to use and charter it so as to um, to make that you know make the asset available to the sector. Um, as I mentioned in my previous slide, I believe we can compete with offshore wind on the installation side, and I think the installation has got so much better over the years that um, you know to, you know across all the projects in the sector. So I, I, you know we're confident that we're we're on the right track with that. Uh, so yeah, that's that's everything from from myself. Uh, th thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Richard. Thanks for uh, staying on on time. Um, <laughs> Yeah, we have one more presentation. So now we will move on to the wave energy sector. We have Michael Hendrickson from a wave piston to talk about their, I believe, a uh, quite recent installation. So um, you should be able to share your screen now, Michael. Thank you. Hearing? Uh, yes it's yes 
it's on the screen. Okay. Yeah, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, yeah, I'm, uh, as you just mentioned, we're going to just give you an update on our latest installation we had. So uh, let's dig into it. Just a bit about ourselves. We are a Danish limited company. We have a, a subsidiary in Gran Canaria. It's also because we're very active there in Gran Canaria. And that's also where we have our test site. We're working on two things. So we are delivering, you know, renewable energy, or we need to replace fossil fuels with renewable energy, and also we are working with desalination, so getting more fresh water out. That's part of our two end products. Uh, the little baby we have looks like this, more or less. So it's a number of we call them energy collectors, these vertical plates that you see, and when the wave passes back and uh, past this uh, the string we call them, then the plates move back and forth, and this generates high pressure water. If you want to see more about this, you can go on our website, etc. There are lots of videos and other things about these things. So I'll dig into the actual projects we have. Uh, we have two ongoing projects that fit, you know, uh, uh, in parallel or in serial after each other. Uh, both uh, are uh, funded uh, or partly funded by European uh, grants, Fast Track Innovation and SME Phase Two. So here, last year, we started our what we call a pre-installation and why pre-installation is because going from the scale version which was between quarter to uh, half scale we had in, in the north sea uh, back uh, we ended in the beginning of 2019 and going to full scale is a large step for us we wanted to test our procedures the components material everything around the installation and also what we need to learn about some operation and maintenance and how the system is behaving so we can get input to optimizing both the procedures the design, etc. So that was the reason for this, where we sort of had this step in between. So we started this last year, uh, did all the assembly. This is the sort of testing everything at our manufacturing site, put everything in containers. That's our concept. We can get everything into vertical containers, got it to Las Palmas, the port there. We assembled it, had the final assembly, put it in the water there, and then got it off. Uh, to a pre mooring site at the, uh, at the, in, the, in the port to get ready for installation, which was fine. We we're ready, but then, you know, installation wise, there's more than just the technical part. We have, a, have all these uh, bureaucracy and uh, procedures approval, and suddenly there were some uncertainties and permission, etc., which we had to deal with. Uh, and also, this about you can see that going to these places in Las Palmas is a very large port. And also talking about these different uh, types of vessels that are uh, available actually is very limited, even though it's a large port. So that's also something we needed to build in into our installation procedures to see what is available actually when you don't have a very large system to install. So our storyboard is we have our anchors that we have to pull in, that's in each end. Then we have to connect uh, um, the our buoys and then our string to tow a string to the side and then connect in the end making a tensioning at the end so so it's sort of like a stepwise approach with the, the vessels available this is what i'm going to show how we did this so uh, we had the pre-mooring side our uh, our mooring is the anchor it's, it's, it's a chain uh, it's a it's a, a slack mooring but a very um, what you call it in English, unsteep, <laughs> a flat mooring, but uh, with, with chain and, and, and mooring rope. So with, the, with a small multi cat, we got that installed, and we also got the anchor placed very well. Uh, and then we called the uh, tugboat to pull the anchor in, 70 tons. So that's, of course, the pendency. There needs to be a tugboat that can do this for us. And uh, then something happened suddenly because there was not focusing all people on all the things that need to be done. So there was some corrections to be done in our with our mooring rope not to break it. That was done also by divers that cost a bit extra. And then we get everything in control here as you can see on the mooring side. Well then then we need to tension the system. We need to have a system that sort of stays a bit in tension so we can harvest the energy and it, it doesn't get slack at any time. We can also again use the multi cap for this purposes and uh, 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 was also discussed before then this uh, you know some the special equipment this was a step adjuster from Firehawk standing on the seabed where we can pull a chain through to tension the system it got 
more complicated because it's difficult to do when having things on the seabed doing these things. We manage, but it's something as a learning that we don't want to do this the same way next time. So in the end, December, the system was installed at the Plokan uh, site. It was a system which was full scale, but it's only two energy collectors. And the plan is to get up to 24 energy collectors. So we had it lying there until March. And then we took everything up in the harbor that was just south of the test site, a small harbor called Aninaga. We could be in working in uh, the camp place. So you can see a very nice place here. Dismantled and actually everything from the smaller size to the bigger size and dismantled to see how our uh, things behaving, uh, any problems with the material, components, etc. to give this input to our uh, engineering people to update some of the design and the procedures. So that's where we are now. Uh, we are also taking a look at the biofilding. It's 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 uh, quite warm uh, uh, environment down there. So there's constant biofouling uh, where we tested before it was more seasonal. That we need to take into consideration also for operation and maintenance. It's not a problem as such that we have things growing here, but it's just in once in a while we need to clean, for instance, our filters to 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 suck in the seawater. So it's also good learning. Uh, so what is, happens now, that is that we are doing these up, upgrades to the design, we're doing upgrades on how to install the system. And then we having uh, the first full scale installation end of 2021 with some follow up with some iterations and then a full one again in uh, end of 22, that's the plan. So what's the experience here so far? Well. All the things up to the installation was actually working fine. Uh, manufacturing, the pre-assembly, checking, logistics, getting the system out, assembly, and also the installation. We got it installed, although with some you know, longer uh, time than planned. What didn't work that well was there was very large bureaucracy around all these things, being able to work at the port, getting things out, the towage and towage plans. So we had to pay different people. We had to get a different part in which we're not used to because working in the North Sea and the West Coast of Denmark, we got a general approval and that would just, just work. Here it was every time we did something that then we needed to do something extra or get some extra uh, approvals or procedures, which is of course a bit frustrating when it's, well, we're talking about also part of the development. It was also a bit of a surprise, this limited competition availability of vessels in the, in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the port because there were a lot of vessels there, but there are a lot of restrictions on, on, uh, on who are allowed to do one of these things uh, and, and uh, who is allowed to, to do things uh, 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 to tow it, et cetera. So that actually caused some, some frustration there. We are uh, sort of a first mover on this isolated island. The isolated island is this, uh, um, and in Plokin, we have the platform we need to connect to, et cetera, and all these things that we're preparing that that makes us, it gives us some, of course, uh, some extra work on, on, on doing that. And then we had some of our material and components underperforming. For instance, this that we just saw earlier, uh, that uh, if you have duplex and some steel, then uh, don't do that. Uh, even though uh, it has been designed, engineered, the drawings, but without any, uh, Combine those two uh, things, then suddenly it's one of the manufacturers had done it without we were able to notice it only after we actually dismantled the system and were looking through all the stuff. So, what will we do? Well, right now we, will, we are simplifying the installation so we avoid actually our towage as such or minimize it anyway so we're not depending on getting approvals of all these things. We can attach and detach every single energy collector. Uh, so it's easy to install, but also for operation and maintenance later. And then the tensioning system will get that up and do that at surface level, surface level to be able to, to, to make it easier and, uh, and also uh, to better to see what is happening. Um, and operation and maintenance, we had the biofire I mentioned, and this about that we're able to take energy collectors on and off, that we are improving that setup. And then the last thing, this, this material, I call it check and trial, but it's of course all this about factory acceptance, just getting all the details also before it's assembled to be sure that the actual suppliers also do what they're supposed to do. Uh, then we have trials onshore and onshore testing, and then we build in iterations 
in, in what we're doing. So actually we have several iterations now because we can take uh, uh, modules on and off to improve over the time of the two projects. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you. Welcome. Now we are ready for the Q&A. So there you go. While the audience is typing their questions, I would like to kind of open the door to uh, the door, <laughs> the floor <laughs> to all the panelists in case you have any uh, any reactions to each other's uh, presentations or any questions you would like to raise. One thing that I noticed, I think all of you mentioned, is the fact that the operation, operation should really be the core of the design already. So I was wondering if you feel like this is happening, if de developers are already including that in the design phase, and if not, how, get, how that could be improved. Um, I might just give the floor to Richard first. Uh, yes, yeah, certainly. Um, I th think uh, yeah, most of the developers we work with I think I've learned and uh, we tend to get consulted now at a very, very early stage. And uh, obviously we have uh, excellent design capability within our own team. So we're able to to support our uh, our customers, particularly around things like designing web make connectums, re remote hookup systems and things like that, uh, eliminating ROVs and things like that and planning the installation, you know, against particularly for remote areas and, and things like that as to, you know, using the tools that are there. So uh, I think most of the, the developers realize that to save money, they have to engage very, very early and uh, have to involve the uh, in, the installation contractor at the design phase is, is highly beneficial. Thank you. I don't know if Michael or Jason, you want to um, comment on that as well. Michael, I think you mentioned that, you know, you, you did. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes. I would say we try to because it's not easy always because it's, it's also the villa we're going to we say we need to optimize the system uh, for durability etc but and and then uh, there are some changes on the on, on on the road so we have you know different engineers being involved in different things they also need to consider as you say the operation and maintenance so that's part mm -hmm. of the sort of the uh, you can say very processes we have within uh, the 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 company to ensure that we look at from all different angles uh, to optimize the system in the end, having as a cost efficient as possible to bring down the levelized cost of energy, which of mm -hmm. course includes all the different parts from manufacturing, installation, operation, and maintenance, and efficiency of the system. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Yeah. Jason? I, I would, yeah, I would, I would agree entirely with uh, Michael and Richard. I mean, I, I think um, over the last few years, I would say there has been. Um, more of a move to engaging with um, marine operators and, and marine planners at an earlier stage now, which we didn't see. If we turned back the clock around about nine, ten years ago, we didn't see that very much. It was more someone turning up with the technology and telling us how we're going to do it. Um, and I think now uh, people are starting to engage at an earlier stage and and and, um, and then the operation is becoming more successful. But I think it needs it needs that engagement to be able to bring down the cost. Um, you know, we're competing with offshore wind. I mean, they complement each other, all these different technologies. But at the, at the end of the day, the person that's switching on the light in the house um, is not really concerned where the power comes from. They're just concerned about their, their electricity bill. So, mm -hmm. you know, we are competing with that. And I think to for, for uh, all different um, players in the sector to come together at that early stage is, is, is key to success. Mm. Thank you. Um, I am looking at the questions now from the audience. I think uh, the first one is, can you advise what the maximum crane lift capacity is on the multicast available? Um, I think this question came during Jason's presentation, so I'll let you answer that. Yeah, I mean, typically, um, typically you're looking around about 30, 35 tonnes, and then as the radius goes out, to say 10, 12 meters, you, you're um, you're losing that. I think roughly we're around um, 11 tons at 16 meters radius. So it depends on on the radius and how big the device is. Um, most multi-cats are designed with 
two cranes as well, so you can use both cranes to increase the lifting capacity. Um, and it depends on what the device is and what what, what the um, what the lift radius is, basically. But you're you're around about that sort of thirty tons, thirty twenty five to thirty five tons is a kind of easy sort of number to go by. Thank you. Um, looking at the next question, by the way, Michael and uh, Richard, if you want to jump in, just uh, feel free. I'm not looking, just sure. looking at the, <laughs> uh, yeah, the next questions here. Um, there's one for Richard. Uh, indeed, is the connection of the Inyanga Wetmate connection plan as an ROV based operation? No, it isn't. So uh, we, our system is designed to be completely ROV free. That's a direct um, answer. Uh, then have insurance underwriters required the use of marine warranty surveyors and how beneficial or otherwise have you found such surveyors? I'm not sure um, who would like to take this um, question. Uh, I can start with a bit because yeah. we were investigating this with our pre-installation, which of course is less costly than the full one. Uh, and then we discussed also with the with, with new risk advisors and to help us in these things. Uh, so there were not like any uh, official survey in, but we just very quickly saw that the, the insurance market on these things were it was very costly. Uh, end of last year, it's getting better now. So uh, the short uh, answer is, but we didn't have any uh, so new surveyors in, but we had renewable risk advisors in helping us in looking at what are the possibilities of uh, of insurance, uh, of the, besides our own, of course, uh, uh, we call this. Um, uh, I can't remember the term in English. <laughs> uh, you know, ensuring that we don't harm anyone else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I can sort of add to that. I mean, my my own experience mm -hmm. uh, from from the sector. I would say a few years ago, the marine warranty surveyors were an absolute nightmare because they'd nearly all come from oil and gas. And when we were starting off in tidal energy, we just so it's a nightmare getting approval for anything. But I think there are now some marine warranty surveyors who are more open minded to the things we, we do. Um, I think the key thing with war marine warranty surveyors is engage early with them. Um, use ones that know what they're doing. Uh, usually where you have problems is where you've got a marine warranty surveyor that doesn't know what he's doing. Uh, and that, that usually creates most of the issues. And the other thing is look, uh, looking at insurance, um, marine contractors are able to insure their own risks very, very cost effectively, particularly if they have a good track record in insurance claims. So that's another, uh, interesting contractual angle to come from. And, uh, you know, that's something we've deployed on recent pro, you know, we've done 28 offshore projects in the last three years with zero claims. So we have very good, but uh, I, I think, uh, I think the marine warranties of can be beneficial. I think there are far too many insurance claims in this sector that have destroyed the reputation of the sector. And uh, I think we need to, we, we should, you know, be using insurance as a last resort and that hasn't been the case. It's been used as routine on many projects. And I think that's really damaged the reputation of the sector. Thank you. Um, we still have a few minutes for a couple more questions. So, um, taking uh, this is a, a rather long one. I'll just read it out. Right. A general theme for installation marine operations is that it's more economically viable at cost of scale. However, marine energy provides unique opportunities in coastal re resiliency and isolated communities where the large scale installation is not required. So, could you? Please shed any light on how this could be achieved. Um, is it more mature practices or more innovative solutions? Um, um, I, can, I can take that as well because that's actually <laughs> our, our primary <laughs> focus right now on the yeah. station we do. Because of course, as, as it's also written here, uh, uh, when you have a very large utility scale installations, you have very specialized uh, vessels, uh, etc., for, for these things. But right now, we have to take whatever is available. Like we have, even though Grand Canary is the last place, is it, what, what do we have there? Because I, I'm, I can't get Jason to bring uh, his uh, multicat to Grand Canary. Maybe I can, but it may be a bit uh, mm -hmm. expensive. So we need to sort of have, you know, be innovative, say, okay, how can we use these? The, 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 the things the rather simple best that are available the best way. So, it, so there is some, uh, some modular approach 
on how to install it and how to do operation and maintenance. So you don't need a very large specialized vessel in these things. That, that is key. And uh, our own main right now, you could say issue, we say that's because we have these uh, track anchors. We need to pull the anchors in at 70 tons. But the talk boats uh, and might we do less, that that's the main thing. Otherwise, all other things to do with a very simple uh, multi jet or barge or whatever. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'd just like to just add something just um just as an example to that question uh, we uh nothing's impossible and we successfully installed um a shuttle tidal shuttle tidal turbine in uh in Tumi Bay uh for a mangrove uh plantation using um a barge that uh a barge and boats that you wouldn't believe you know you like we well, if a marine warranty surveyor in the UK had gone to see it, the, it would have been condemned. <laughs> but, <laughs> so the, there is vessels and there is um, equipment in some of these really remote locations. I mean, this was an extremely remote location. Um, um, but, you know, I think it does need innovative solutions to come up to use the, the equipment that's there because as you said, you know, it can be costly and uh, expensive to take some of these assets from other locations and then it makes the project not viable. So I think you just got to look and think outside the box, but there, there is, um, it's surprising what, what you can use to make the project work. Yeah, I would, I would add to that. I mean, a lot of my experience with remote locations in the past year, I've done projects in uh, Faroe Islands, Canada, and we're currently planning our own projects in Indonesia. And um, uh, so, generally speaking, <clears throat> I think if the projects are at sufficient scale, I think the supply chain will will rise to the challenge, uh, as we've seen in the Orkney Islands, where there's a lot of, uh, you know, if you went to Orkney Islands 10, 15 years ago, there was nothing there. And uh, now there's, there's loads of operators like Jason and, and uh, Dougie who have got uh, marine assets uh in the area and i think that would happen wherever you go you know if you went to these remote areas uh, uh people would want to be involved and would would want to uh would invest in the assets if we could demonstrate that the technology was was um strong enough in order to attract that that investment into the sector so i, th I think it does does happen naturally i think obviously if we're using very heavy like very big tidal turbines and stuff logistics are a nightmare and that was something that was core to the development of our hydro wing is that the turbines and the control hubs and the uh, connect connection systems all fit in 20 foot iso containers that can be shipped to anywhere in the world so for example if we had a project in indonesia they could all be containerized out there all the steel work could be done locally in local shipyards and uh, this is the type of strategic thinking that we need to deploy and the whole lot can be assembled and uh, deployed relatively easily and the whole configuration can be altered to different locations in order to supply communities. And I think also looking strategically at an area, so perhaps doing several projects in a given area and utilizing the same assets and the same expertise across those projects is, is key. And also talking to other people that are doing projects in those areas and sharing, sharing assets and ideas. Thank you. And I think Richard, you also mentioned the, the need for kind of collaboration and sharing that uh, experience Absolutely. in your presentation as well. Great. Thanks, um, all the panelists. I think uh, the time is up now. And that was an interesting discussion, I find. So, as I said, the presentation and the recording will be on our website in a couple of days. So, uh, you can find them there. Um, yeah, thank you uh, to our audience and the panelists, of course, and see you in our next webinar. Have a nice rest of the day. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.